truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. All right, welcome back, everybody. Special episode. Um, we're doing this very timely because of a, a recent Twitter spat with MSNBC's Stephanie Rule. Rule? Who cares what her name is? She's mean. And so we're. Uh, I brought on uh, my friend, um, uh, Chef Andrew Gruel, to talk about it. Okay, so why is the chef on? First of all, uh, Andrew, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's an honor. So uh, actually... We'll do a quick bio on you first. Um, you're uh, obviously a chef, uh, restaurant owner, prominent in the restaurant business. You're on TV a lot. You're talking about these issues. You've been very outspoken about how the pandemic, not this necessarily just the pandemic, but the government's response to the pandemic has, has really hurt our restaurant industry. And so, you know, thank you for being, for being that voice. Um, but okay, so here was a tweet that came out two days ago by Stephanie Rule uh, from MSNBC, the, uh, the pinnacle of, of, of fair thought and, and nuanced discussion. She said to every restaurant owner who, quote, can't find workers because people are getting paid too much to stay at home, end quote, please join me on MSNBC to discuss how you spent both rounds of forgivable PPP loans and the $28 billion being distributed from the American Rescue Plan You, of course, tweeted back at her, said, I've tried 17 times to contact them. They won't have me on. I I responded to her, dear American small business owners, this is what the liberal media thinks of you. They've never run a restaurant themselves, and they feel nothing but contempt for those who do. Here's the part a lot of people missed. She said, okay, Dan Crenshaw, because that's how she talks. I'd be happy to discuss small biz, big biz, global markets, tax policy, or any, just spell out business. Just spell out business. You have enough characters. It's so annoying. I'd be happy to discuss small biz, big biz, global markets, tax policy, or any other elements of economic recovery. Just join me on MSNBC Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. And then all her Twitter followers are like, oh, owned. Right, owned. You, oh, she's never going to do it. She's never going to do it. Because I'm never on MSNBC, right? Because I never go and just fight them on their own programs. Of course I do. So I say, sure, I'll come on with Chef Gruel since you initially claimed you wanted to talk to restaurant owners, but you refused to have them on. Does that work? She never responded. So that's where we're at now. And so I said, hey, dude, why don't you come on my podcast? And look, what would your response, if she was going to have you on, if I'm Stephanie, God knows I am not. But if I were and I said, what do you know about running a restaurant, Andrew? Uh, What are all the, why are all these small business owners complaining so much when the government is 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 spending money on their behalf? We, We appropriated funds with the PPP program. And then recently, what is wrong with you people? Why don't you just why don't you just use that money and pay people more than and like they should be getting anyway? Why don't you pay them livable wages? Yeah, and I can't and look, there's even another tweet that went before your tweet where when she originally posted that, people started tagging me and I wrote back to her immediately, right? This was probably 12 hours before you engaged with her. And I said, hey, I'm happy to go on the show, right? And frankly, I didn't know much about her background. Um, I don't watch the 9 a.m. show on MSNBC, although name of the network says a lot, but happy to have that conversation. And I think, frankly, she'd be pleasantly surprised to find that there's more nuance to this that I would suggest than a lot of people who are uh, tribalized on Twitter would suggest. You would think she she has a background working in banking, Credit Suisse, Dutch, like she's she she is their primary correspondent for business news. So I this is very detached and very it's, it's, it's her tweet was so full of contempt. That's what really struck me by it. Well, contempt and uh, it, it was very condescending. Right. The and, and by the way, yeah, to add more granularity to that, her background is in derivatives trading, which we all know had nothing to do with the previous uh, crisis in 2008. Oh. <laughs> but uh, that would have been good so, prep if we'd been on their show. God, it would have been great. Um, oh, why didn't she have us on? I, hey, who knows? Maybe she will. But look, the fact of the matter is, is that let me, you know, in this, let me say one thing here. 
Uh, so I started slap fish in 2011 as a food truck, right? I've been in a restaurant industry my whole life. After dropping out of the liberal arts uh, college circuit, I realized that food and, and, and cooking was what I wanted to do. And then trained around the United States and the world to get involved in the food and restaurant industry. And then ultimately took all my savings, bootstrapped myself, took all my credit cards, maxed them out in 2011, right? At, still at the peak of a recession. And I started, I, I got one food truck to launch the brand. I went from one food truck to four and then ultimately rolled all that over into a brick and mortar. I raised $90,000 in, uh, you know, 18 tranches, $5,000 each from friends and family and anybody else I could get, whether it was through Kickstarter to open up our first brick and mortar. Fast forward today, we've got 28 locations. I have three other concepts of so 31 restaurants nationwide, all independently owned or franchised, never brought on private equity investment, never got involved with Wall Street, um, her cronies. All of this has been done completely organically. So the point being is, is that I understand the gauntlet of operating and running restaurants or businesses, small businesses, specifically not just in California, which is effectively behind enemy lines when it comes to being a small business owner, but nationwide by virtue of our franchise system and me working with independent independent, I emphasize that, franchisees. So my experience in all of this has been the fact that the government centralized from a state perspective and a federal perspective has constantly been behind the ball on this, right? And both sides of the aisle. I'm not trying to target necessarily her cronies, but we were behind the ball. Now, what we've seen, of course, is, is that Republicans have been a lot quicker to deregulate and to open up the free market where Democrats have tried to use this as a predicate by which they can control the economy even more, which is what we're dealing with here in California. But what I would tell Stephanie is, is that, look, first of all, you want to traipse out all of these programs that the government has put forth in order to help small businesses, specifically the American Rescue Plan, which is the more recent restaurant program. Twenty eight billion dollars was 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 subscribed to within hours, all to minority and female owned businesses. So there was applications upwards of $100 billion, um, the majority of which are either going to be rejected or nobody knows what's going to happen. And then furthermore, the second round and the first round of the PPP funding was based on a very simple mathematic formula, which is 2020 sales minus 2019 sales, which gives you the metric by which you then are approved for certain loans. Her cronies, her buddies in Silicon Valley, the same people that were taking 30 cents on every dollar of every delivery sale through DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera, are the ones that are now going to create a situation where the businesses that, quote, pivoted, which, of course, every Twitter expert told you to do, are not, whose sales remain the same because they kept their sales steady by virtue of these third party deliveries, but then lost 30 cents on every dollar, further exacerbating their losses now can't get the PPP funds. There's no stipulation in the program to fix or, or remedy that situation. Or furthermore, here in California, one in every three restaurants is shut down permanently. What are those 30% of restaurant owners going to do? And she doesn't necessarily have answers to that. Instead, it's just about being snarky and gaining some sort of a slam dunk by virtue of who knows what. Well, it, what, what, what she would say is, well, I would be in favor of appropriating that $100 billion. You know, because that's what they'd say. And, and and my response to that is, well, okay, first, there's no limiting principle to that. And if you actually talk to small business owners, they don't want more handouts. They just want to be open. They just want to be open because even even if you are, even if you do get the loan, it, it's difficult. It's a process. There's strings attached. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's an imperfect system, like you said. And, and that's about, the I think, the, the, the best it could be constructed in a short amount of time. Look, it was it was a better rescue package than, say, the 2008 rescue package, which was, you know, really just for big banks. So, you know, it was it was certainly better. I mean, the PPP program fundamentally was designed by Marco Rubio and, and Republicans. Not perfect. Um, but it, it, the, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The point is, let people open safely. Yep. Restaurants have, you know, we've been having this debate for a year. Restaurants are some of the safest places. You already have so many standards in place for cleanliness uh, it was it, once once the data was out that transmissions weren't happening in restaurants and bars primarily. It, it should have been it should have been endgame by that point. It should have just opened. And, and by the time we were even having this debate in January of this year about another twenty eight billion dollars, it's like, look, we got a, I got a lot of pushback for even voting for that December uh, boondoggle um, because yep. I was like, look, we haven't we haven't refilled the PPP program in a while. We have to do it. Um, and we did it. But I actually got a ton of like a wild amount of backlash for that because people are like, we don't want handouts. We just want to be open. That's that's it.
Well, well, yeah. And I think that the piece that was missed there was that the handout should have gone to retroactively, retroactively to the businesses that were shut down. These businesses have been completely forgotten about. And here in California, it's once again, it's more than one out of every five, right? It's not 20 percent. It's 30 percent, 30 percent plus because of the inability to open and operate within the free market framework. You're right, right? And I've said this from the very beginning, restaurants are inherently trained in order to maintain safe and sanitary conditions. We should have been at the forefront of modeling the right behavior from a small business or a business perspective to prove that you can be both open and safe. And that works, right? And now you're right, 18 months down the road, we look back at the numbers and we say, okay, well maybe causation and correlation were not connected to the degree that the scientists implied that they were from a restaurant perspective. We were vilified. And, and to her point more specifically, because the point she's making is that it, let's, say, let's say you did get a piece of that $28 billion pie or the PPP program. And a, and a lot of restaurants did. Um, let's say you get a piece of that. I'm not even sure her argument makes sense that you could then hire now. Like, like as if it's your fault that people aren't coming to work. I know for a fact that small businesses continue to raise wages. She doesn't seem to understand that there is a limit to how much you can raise wages. You can raise menu prices. You already are raising menu prices because of inflation. So how much more can you really raise menu prices before you, you decrease demand? I know these are big words for, 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 for but, but she, they shouldn't be, right? She, she, she may, might have a degree in business or economics. She's obviously worked in the space. She under, should understand the the, the 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 things at play here you decrease demand and then you can't make a profit either way so there is a limit of course to how much you can raise prices right yeah and even if <laughs> let's just say and let's well let's see her side through right so hypothetically she's saying okay all this money that came in should have been used now to increase wages to the level that you can bring you know supply and demand can meet right so it's an indictment on restaurant workers saying that they're not paying their workers enough and that's really been the overarching conversation mm -hmm. to all of this which frankly i think are two totally separate issues and they're conflating the two of them to make it more complicated to increase minimum wage around the horn yeah. but let me say this we have always prided ourselves on paying 30 to 40 percent above minimum wage. I'm a firm believer just for my business alone, right? This isn't for everybody. And I mean this not from a not from a federally mandated perspective, but I believe that if I can keep wages higher than my competition, I'm going to have lower turnover and therefore I'm going to have in the long run a lower Better labor business, cost. Yeah. Right. Well, so what we did was we have increased wages and I'm paying entry level workers right now. 20 to 25 dollars an hour i'm talking dishwashers wait staff now wait staff in a tipped state right we don't have tip wage so my servers at 20 dollars an hour with an extra hundred dollars over uh, you know across a five hour shift that's 40 dollars an hour and even at those wages 20 25 in my pizza joints i'm paying 30 bucks an hour i'm not getting the the, the demand hasn't gone up in terms of people applying for jobs so that's the missing piece of this. Yeah. So people that, just go ahead. Go ahead. Well, MSNBC and Washington Post came out with a story this week and they interviewed me on the story. Now, guess what? They didn't use my any of my content because it didn't match their narrative. But MSNBC mm -hmm. post prints this story that says when you increase wages, suddenly those businesses can find workers. That's not true. They, they're finding select narratives where perhaps you can kind of connect the dots. I've got 30 restaurants around the United States. We've increased wages significantly. And in yeah. the Southern California example, we've increased to $30 an hour for entry level positions. And we can we cannot find workers. So I've gone out there. I've asked everybody. I've spoken to some of the people that we're trying to hire are people who previously worked for us. And I've said, what is it that is preventing you from coming back? We're a great employer. We're paying 30 bucks an hour, 25, right? What is it? And they've given me their real life anecdotal data to explain to me why that's the case. And every time I try and put that up on Twitter or I post it out there, I get completely taken out by Kami Antifa Twitter for not paying a living wage. Hmm. Okay, but what is their what is their real life anecdotal story? Is 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 it the is it the unemployment insurance problem? So it's a combo, right? It is nuanced. So it's not specific it's not always the unemployment, right? Yes. 
in certain circumstances, people are saying, I am making enough on unemployment right now that I want to see this thing through. But hear me out, right? That's not laziness. And I'm not I'm not implying people are lazy. Here in California it's a bad decision, but it's a financial it's a it's a rational decision. I think it's, it's a, a bad one, but it's a rational one. It's a cost benefit analysis. But what's interesting is here in California, when they shut down uh, outdoor dining in December and the entire restaurant industry went virtually under, right? People then lost their jobs and they applied for unemployment benefits. Newsom was like, oh, shoot, whoops, we, we misappropriated $40 billion in unemployment benefits. So the system's in gridlock right now. You guys can't get your unemployment benefits. So for months, people were in it, unable to get unemployment benefits. Now they're finally starting to get them retroactively. So it's actually not current because mm -hmm. they've been refreshed by virtue of the Biden administration. So these people are saying, well, I waited so long and I got screwed from the open, close, open, close, open, close here in California. I'm going to see this through to really, really understand and believe that we're actually open. I see. And what's interesting about yeah, that, that. That's a fair. That's a very fair position to take. So, but again, it's government's fault. <laughs> that, that's my point. Yes, exactly. That's my point. So if you just remove the government hand from this pot and you just remove all of this and allow the free market to open and operate, then you won't run into those situations. And this is why when Newsom came out a couple days ago and said, we're going to remain on emergency order, which is merely just so that he can have these powers, the PR message that that sends to our workforce is there's more lockdowns coming because they hear that, oh, and then you got Fauci out there talking about, you know, the, you know, whatever, you know, the Kalamazoo variant. And people are like, oh, shit, well, these are all the elements that I heard about last year that led to the 17th lockdown. Who knows if in California it's not going to happen again? The second piece to this, which once again involves government intervention, is child care, right? Schools are closed. So yeah. parents have California. to decide, I'm going to put my kid in school or I'm going to pay for child care. And I would pay for the child. I would stay home, right? I'm not, I'm not going to put my kid in a public school system to learn about critical race theory when I can be at home watching them. I'll take the unemployment benefits to avoid them getting into that boondoggle, right? Yeah. And then thir thirdly, a lot of, uh, this is a real, real true story within our world is that a lot of these young entry level workers that are getting their first jobs in the restaurant industry are getting treated like such shit by these customers. We had a girl the other day, right? She's 18 years old, works for us. Two little old ladies come in without masks on. They must have been vaccinated. They saw the CDC guidance, et cetera. Some guy comes up behind them, flips a chair. Guy's like 45 years old, starts screaming at these two little old ladies. This poor 18-year-old girl doesn't know what to do. Eventually, my kitchen crew comes out and removes the guy. This girl calls me. She's like, it's not you. It's not how much you're paying me. I just can't work in this environment anymore. People have lost their damn minds. Where so is she this? Quit. Where did that happen? It was Huntington Beach, California, right in one of my restaurants. This is why I moved to Texas. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's and it's these, it's these not cases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's already hard enough being an 18 year old server. It's, it's already, that's already hard enough. And then you add the crazies on it. Like what, why is this man even inside this place? If, if you're that scared, if you're yeah. that crazy, just don't go out in public. And, and frankly, you know, st stay in your home forever. Uh, if, yeah, if, if he was really... eating his food outside. He left his food, came inside to cause a scene because these 75, 80 year old ladies didn't have masks on. This is this is uh, that gets to a whole new uh, conversation about the, the psychological pathology that has overtaken much of America <laughs> um, with with respect to this disease. I mean, um, we, we still can't do in person committee hearings, not not all committees, but our committee, the Democrats are just like, no, we just and I'm like. I, I don't know at this point when like cases are so low, people are vaccinated. Like, what are you honestly that now I don't know what standard you're trying to meet. Um, if, if, if now isn't the time it's, um, it really has become this sort of obsession with, with fear and obsession with living with the pandemic. It's, it's a very odd thing. And it's even, it's even more odd that it fell so perfectly along political lines. I think it's I think it's one of the more fascinating and an under talked about understudied phenomena of this entire pandemic is how it became a left right issue and how we basically assess risk and deal with it. Really strange to me. Um, yeah, deeper conversation. Okay, tell us about maybe, maybe the last thing. Um, uh, now that we've sort of uh, we've sort of shadow boxed Stephanie who didn't want to have <laughs> us on. Um, 
Look, I mean, she was smart not to, right? She looks tough to her Twitter followers, and uh, I respond, and she just, just, like, ignores me. And her Twitter followers have no idea that I even responded. So, look, I, I get the game, Stephanie. I get it. It's fun. We all, we're all having fun. Um, but but wouldn't, wouldn't you think, though, that, that it just the, the jet, like, content, right? Yeah. I mean, you're on you the, would you're think, on the actually, yeah. You're on the government side. I'm on the I'm on the side of experiencing this, you know, day in and day out. You yeah. would think that a general conversation of differing viewpoints, right, would would be productive. To and she's gonna research. make me answer. She's gonna make me answer why I didn't vote for that for that last um, for that last stimulus bill. You know, and I'm yeah. fine with that. Like, like, you know, I, it's not like you know have me in some kind of difficult question. No, I think it's an easy question to answer. Maybe she realizes that I have an easy answer for it. I don't know. I mean, and the easy answer is, of course, look, just because you put one thing I agree with in a bill doesn't mean I can vote for the rest of it. Uh, yeah. That was like two trillion dollars. And most of it was going to state bailout funds when places like California are actually operating at a surplus. Anyway, also, as it turns out, just reports today that there's well over six. It's assumed now there's a well over 60 billion dollars that might uh, an analysis show that that might be fraudulent payouts for unemployment insurance. So. Look, That's right, the majority of which is in lion share out of California. Sounds like it, based on what you just told me about what they already admitted to be true. Um, talk, one of the other uh, problems facing the restaurant industry these days is certainly uh, inflation. Um, what's your perspective on that? I don't think there's been enough analysis done on why inflation is really happening. We kind of just blame Biden for it, and it's fun. But we, we, we need to understand why it's happening. And look, my, my take on it is is effectively pent up demand and a, and, a, and a complete destruction of supply. And then when demand skyrocketed, the supply couldn't keep up. That's my theory. Is that what, it, what are you, how do you guys see that in the restaurant industry? Yeah. And I mean, you know, keep in mind, I'm just a dishwasher cook. Um, so, you know, I don't have the economic acumen as somebody like yourself. I, I don't know. Uh, I saw you use big words before. Uh, I just I memorize them. So I, what was I think inflation this year was projected to be what 2.2, 2.3 percent. Right now we're at 4.6 percent overall. Um, the Fed, which is obviously you know the uh, inflationary watchdog, is indicating that we shouldn't be worried at all. This is merely temporary, and that of course is meant to calm the nerves. But yet they're simultaneously putting trillions of dollars out there, which we know by the definition of inflation is too many dollars t- chasing too few goods. Well, if we're exacerbating those issues, right, we're adding the dollars and we're decreasing the goods, whether it's supply chain hiccups as a result of the labor issues, the result is going to be what I'm seeing right now on the streets is that 30 percent of every single one of my restaurants is being shorted supplies day in and day out. I've seen my prices increase, but I'm also, you know, in a seafood world, right? So we are a lot more sensitive to a commodity index increasing because of the labor that's necessary to process the seafood, a lot of which used to come internationally, as you know, um, and now there's not as much of that. But we've seen 50 to 60 percent price increases around the board, and we are already distilling all of that through to the end user. Now, the question is, and I talk to a lot of my other contemporaries in this industry, the restaurant industry specifically, they've already pushed those prices down onto their consumer. What, do you think that – give me an example where somebody has decreased their prices after increasing their prices. You know, I joke on Twitter. I say it's permanent. That's and true. Like, oh, it's temporary. If I printed and spent $4,000 for new menu boards, new menus, et cetera, even on it from a digital perspective, the labor that goes into changing things across an enterprise – I'm not going to now go back after the consumer has gotten used to that, even if it means now my margins are stronger, right? Um, And that's an argument that maybe Stephanie could make is restaurants margins are better, but they're not paying their employees enough and the employee wages aren't keeping up with, with, um, you know, the, the price index increases. But that's another conversation for another time. Those prices are set. And the same is going to happen to me, right? My lobster price went from $19 a pound, $20 a pound a year ago, processed lobster. Right now, it's going to approach $40 a pound if we don't get more boats on the on the water. We're at about 35 Those lobster processors are not going to come back to 19 Even if all of the elements come back together, they'll drop to 25 right? Like the, the, yeah. the floor will be higher than what it theoretically should be. Because everything else is going up. You know, we hear yesterday about like BlackRock Capital Partners buying out all these homes and everybody's mad at them. But it's like, don't be mad at them. 
be mad at the policy that creates this low price debt, which gives them the opportunity to go in and take on these new assets yeah. at a better, you know, it's not, it's not, the, it's not them. It's not just like, it's not us, the restaurant owners. We're merely, you know, operating within this economy that's being, you know, in my opinion, manipulated to some degree by the Fed. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And, and I've heard the same about lumber too. It's like once once they realize people are willing to pay certain prices, you know, yeah, the lumber is not going back down, and that's that's kind of terrifying to those of us who maybe want to build a home someday. Um, okay, last last uh, topic for you because I saw you uh, tweet about this is um, is basically sustainable fishing. Um, was it aquaphonics? Is that aquaponics? Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell us about that. That was kind of an interesting uh, thing that you mentioned. Yeah. So, so aquaponics, which effectively is integrated aquaculture, right? Growing vegetables alongside um, seafood, which can be done in an urban area in a closed contained system. Because if, when it's closed loop, right, basically to get into the raw, literally, it, the fish poop is the fertilizer that feeds the vegetables. And then the vegetable scraps are what feeds the fish. And it's this closed loop system. No effluent doesn't need to be done in an open ocean. Now, what's really fascinating about aquaculture and aquaponics is that we don't have a framework here in the United States to actually farm seafood either in the open ocean or from a federal perspective or using the Armour Corps of Engineer to mandate and regulate it on a city level. Hmm. So we don't have that because Sierra Club and all of these special interest groups are lobbying against it because they feel like it's in their environmental interest to do so. But yet the alternative is we import all of that import with that seafood from China. Yeah, that's we're overfishing our oceans horribly. Yeah, yeah, and this these this these aquaculture systems are actually relieving pressure off the wild stock species, which are going to give fishermen a better quota. If you can now take even five or ten percent of the demand and utilize land-based aquaculture systems, but there needs to be some sort of a federal or even a state framework to do so, and it's incredibly inexpensive. So what I've said is is that you know we we have the issue of these food deserts in inner city areas where. Those have been talked about for decades, right? You know, um, high obesity uh, in conjunction with malnutrition, right? It's this yeah. crazy paradox. And of course, all of the all of the nutritionists say, well, what are their options for food, right? Fast food, liquor stores, it's all the packaged stuff. There's really no, mm -hmm. no high quality grocers. I've said, take a lot of this dead real estate and introduce vertical aquaponics in old warehouses, old real estate situations. You can even use retired fishermen who otherwise can't go out because of some of the stocks that have been overfished to manage these systems because they're actually very similar to just the general bi biodynamic nature of the way in which an ocean works. You're, you're, you're mechanically reproducing that system. Um, That's and interesting. Can, and it's, and it's economical. You could, you could, if you, if you were allowed, like if the government just let you do it right now, you could build it and make a profit. You could definitely make a profit. You would need some sort of subsidy because I think at first, at, on the front side of it, the energy cost would be relatively high. But if you look at that and you offset that against some of the other externalities that might exist, I think that you would have a net gain, right? You would actually have a net gain. Um, and, and I'm not necessarily saying government subsidies from the sense of the government giving money. I'm saying subsidize or create situations whereby the investors are incentivized to invest in the early stage startup of it, right? Um, yeah. You know, ta tax benefits. Oh, well, there's and, opportunity zones. I mean, those are huge tax benefits. Um, it just seems like there's nobody really thinking about this a lot. I have heard of uh, the, the skyscraper farms, people talking about mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, it just, yeah, I, I don't have time to deep dive into it too much, but it is it, it, interesting ideas. Um, when we talk about so those are sexy, but the output is minimal, right? You need to do you need to vertically you need to vertically integrate protein, right? If you're just doing vegetables, it, that's incredibly inefficient because it requires processing and cleaning. Um, yeah. But but the the seafood element, because we have a deficiency of omega three fatty acids in our diet, and we actually have an over abundance of omega six fatty acids, which leads to hypertension, diabetes, a lot of the ailments that are causing all of these healthcare costs to increase. Yeah. The omega three fatty acids fight against the omega sixes. The omega sixes in our body are a lot stronger. So if I eat a piece of salmon and then I follow it up with like six burgers because they were corn fed, it was corn fed beef. The omega sixes are basically wiping out the the healthy brain food that I got from the omega threes. Um, and that le and the omega sixes are what leads to inflammation at the root of all of our issues. It's all inflammation. Um, so if we can eat this higher quality, healthier protein, 
in the long run, we're theoretically decreasing healthcare costs. Yeah, no, I mean that that goes without saying. Also, people should should buy their uh, omega three supplements. Um, yeah, and vitamin D. Everybody's deficient in vitamin D. I mean, like it's it it is frustrating how easy it would be to actually uh, solve healthcare. I mean, <laughs> there's so many people in this country that wanted to that wanted to infringe on people's freedoms and privacy uh, to save them. Uh, during this past year, well, fine. If we're going to go along that same bank, we can we just why don't we just make everybody exercise and and take their vitamins? Yeah. Um, no, that's a fascinating idea, uh, and I'd love to see where it goes. It's something uh, we should certainly l- look into. Um, it's and, probably uh, not, I don't think that's probably not going to go anywhere. As I always joke, I say, when does a uh, when does an environmentalist uh, or when do, when does a uh, developer become an environmentalist? Well, but but that's kind of the fad these days. I think if it if it could ever gain traction, it seems like now. Um, I'm trying to think why the environmentalists uh, activists would be against it, but they're they're often against things that are good for the environment. They're, they're they have a very strange incentive structure. Exactly my point. Yeah, and I could get into that, um, but you you read my point there. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey Andrew, thank you so much for being on. And uh, hey, hey, maybe uh, maybe Stephanie will will reach out, and then we can have an honest discussion on our show to her audience. Well, hey, I appreciate you you giving me the platform and allowing me to kind of babble about this type of stuff. So, you know, Stephanie never gave it to me. Yeah, no, they like their narratives. All right. Hey, thanks, man. Keep up the fight. And um, and uh, to all restaurant owners out there, we're praying for you. We got your back. So thank you so much. Appreciate it.